Hello and welcome to this episode of Sexier Than a Squirrel, where we talk through how you can become sexier than that squirrel to your dog. Hashtag I am sexy. <laughs> there you go. You know what? It is all about actually real life distractions, real life results, and that's how um, it rolls, right? Yeah, absolutely. And in this episode, what we want to talk about is actually... You know, what happens when you can't go for a walk or is there actually a benefit to not going for a walk? We're all told that like that archaic rule that if your dog's under 15 kilos, you walk them once a day. If they're over 15 kilos, you've got to walk them two to three times a or day. But actually, add, what does it mean? It might be even add like five minutes per walk, right? Sorry, per month. So some people say you can add five minutes every week they get older. You can add yeah. five minutes or 10 minutes per month or Who there's all of those like breed specific mm -hmm. uh, advice groups. What we would say is potentially there might be a benefit to reshaping your walk yeah so with that before we get started we should do some game changer wins because there are many of you going through the online worldwide sexier than a squirrel challenge and if you don't know what that is yet go to absolutedogs.me forward slash sexy and you're getting some pretty cool results so for example jan with Rosie was sexier than a hedgehog. Prickly. I love it. Um, and then we also have Hazel, who, I mean, this one's just, I'm just overwhelmed with emotion about this one. <laughs> um, I am sexier than a robot mower. Yesterday was the first time my seven month old Vizsla saw my robot mower in action. And he was furious, furious with it and intrigued by, by it in equal measures. But you know what? Hazel beat that mower. She was sexier. I love it. She says, I spend the day uh, using uh, her training training academy games to, to combat the environment, yeah. right? Like, and that's what it's about. I love it. Sexier than a mower, sexier <laughs> than a hedgehog. I love it. Well done, guys. So keep those coming in. If you're obviously, if you're part of the Sexier Than a Squirrel online challenge, then put your wins in that Facebook group. If you're not yet, then send them to us on Facebook, on Instagram, and post them as comments under posts, you name it, we'll spot them and then we'll pick a couple every episode to read out. Now, no walks. This sounds scary. And I think the first thing that we've got to say on this is this whole rule of if your dog's less than 15 kilos, you walk them once a day. If they're over 15 kilos, you walk them twice a day. It is made up. Crazy. It's in all the books, it's what we all got taught, but it's made up. And in fact, there are certain cultures um, and um, and places in the world where it's it, dogs don't go on walks and in the in the like in the orthodox sense. There is no rule, right, Tom? Like I yeah. think that's the thing. There is no rule. We can. We, I mean, you guys, if you've been listening for a while, you know that we ditch the routine, we ditch the bowl, and for us, there's no rule that. I mean, some days um, our dogs will get. Um, we, we definitely will be on the moorland or we'll be on the beach, and other days we'll um, reshape the walk and we'll be maybe in a home setting. So yeah. reshaping the walk. That's what we're talking about today. And actually, we see that sometimes it can almost be a little bit of a gift. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the the first reason why it could be. A a, um, the first reason why not walking your dog could be a gift is because effectively every dog has a bucket and exciting things pay into that bucket like a glass of water in there scary things pay into that bucket another glass of water in there and over the course of maybe a few hours, over the course of a week, that bucket might get so full that it overflows. So let's give an example of things that might fill the bucket. So I'm out on a walk, let's say I've gone up to the moorland with my dog, and um, another dog runs straight out from yeah. nowhere, apparently appears. I didn't even see the owner actually. Mm -hmm. This was, I'm gonna give you an example of my morning walk this morning. And um, they appear from nowhere and that dog is not aggressive or not unfriendly, but it appears. so. Maybe that's a glass in the bucket. Yeah. Uh, then we go in the water, we play ball, we play chase a bit. We're, um, we're doing a little bit of water fun. Yeah. Uh, we're splashing around. It's a great time. There's a lot of um, energy going around, potentially another glass. Yeah. And it's not a bad glass or a good glass, it's yeah. a glass. And then maybe you come home and the postman knocks at the door and your dog kind of gets quite excited or scared about that and starts barking. And then that's that another dance glass. squirrel appears Oh my word. In your garden. The squirrel appears. That's, you know, a couple of glasses in there. And then you go for your evening walk and you're walking along. Your dog's on lead and they see a lady with a pram or a pushchair with a, a, a crying baby in there gets pushed around the corner. Your dog... Lady still attached gets, to the pushchair. Gets, <laughs> gets a bit freaked out, starts crazy barking. And you say to yourself, oh my word, he's never done that before. 
And no, he hasn't done that before. That is the result of an overflowing bucket. And the thing is, it could be anything from exciting things like Tom and I have said that pay into that bucket and also things that you really weren't expecting. Like for me, our cat, he often pops out when he just wants to appear within a within a lesson or he just he pops out. You know what? The cat's, he, he's quite an exciting experience for many dogs. And at the same time, yeah. he still pays in the bucket. Yeah, absolutely. He pays into my bucket for a different reason, <laughs> but we won't talk about that. Wow. So, um, so what we've got to think is that actually for many dogs, the walks, the daily walks or the twice daily walks can be the biggest contributor to bucket fill. So for example, a lot of times when let's say I'm working with a behavior case, they might come to me for like some crazy, crazy, seemingly weird problem, right? So maybe it's like, uh, I don't know, uh, jumping up at light and trying to bite light or chasing shadows or obsessive licking and biting of a foot. Like I'm, I'm going for the like the craziest here. And nine times out of 10, to some extent, those dogs are actually a victim of their routine in that they're being walked once daily or twice daily. The walks are stressful because those dogs maybe bark and lunge at other dogs or people on walks, or maybe they go for a walk and they do loads of like chuck it tennis ball throwing and they get very excited about that. And actually just reducing the walks, forget anything specific about some of the crazy struggles that they're having, um, actually improves their behavior. Now, the thing that always shocks me this, Tom, is because um, I've got a couple of um, very close friends who um, absolutely brilliant close friends. And yet I've never got into this discussion too much because I know it's like a prickly topic almost. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one very close friend, she insists that she must walk because she lives in a smaller um, terraced house. Mm -hmm. They don't have a big garden and she owns active breeds. Mm -hmm. And she insists, even though they go out, they lunge, they bark, they growl, they often um, bark at dogs across the street. Mm -hmm. They often cause her a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And yet she insists they still must do yeah. that. Now, what's that really about? Yeah, so the, the interesting thing is, is um, so the, 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 sometimes I'll just ask questions in the hope that people will find the right answer. And so it might be that I say, you know, how, how often do you go for a walk? And they might say, oh, we go twice. And I'll say, right, okay, twice, twice a day, brilliant. And are those walks um, stressful? They're like, oh my God, they're stressful. Um, you know, he barks and lunges at everything he he if he sees a cyclist he like darts to the end of the lead and then he like flips himself on the end of the lead because he's got his collar and lead on um, and I'm like oh okay okay writing it down writing it down and then I'll say do you think he enjoys that experience and they're like oh no I don't think he does ah okay so do you think we should maybe be walking him quite as frequently as we are. No, I just always thought I had to. And it's like, it's sometimes- It's almost like permission, isn't yeah, it? It's all, yeah, exactly. It's permission to be a great dog owner in that often we do things and we know that it doesn't quite, it doesn't quite feel right. These are typically the times when we, we feel quite stressed about it, where we're putting our dog in a situation, we know it's not gonna go well, and then lo and behold, it doesn't go well. And sometimes we know really what we need to do, but that society and the books are telling us to do the opposite and we just need permission, right? Now, the funny thing is, um, this morning actually is a great example. Um, we went onto the moorland, but I didn't take um, one of my border collies. And the reason I didn't take her is because I know on the moorland there's stock. Yeah. And I know that doesn't just fill my bucket, it fills her bucket. So she's interested in stock and the permanent like constant me looking towards her to try and um, work games and, and interrupt and manage effectively actually doesn't make my walk very enjoyable at all so I would say actually um for me and for her it's a decision that I make yeah. and because I know that that isn't the right walk whereas if I'm going to the beach perfect mm -hmm. so what I'd also say and this is a funny one for you guys and you may um you may have to hear it a few times is that fair doesn't have to mean equal and yeah. and so for me I did take some of my dogs and I didn't take her and I left her with a stuffed bone she had it stuffed with some really great um she has her supplements and her tripe mixed together um I stuffed it I've I had it it was frozen overnight uh, so she had it this morning and whilst I went out with the other guys she had that one and mum and dad kept an eye on her they're here mm -hmm. um, so they, they're on site still with us um, for those of you that know we have a, a family farm and, and for her that for me is a good deal mm -hmm. and I think sometimes it's knowing what's a good deal yeah. and you don't have to do exactly the same for every dog and you don't have to do the same in every moment and you don't have to stick to anyone else's in judgment fact, or rules in fact you're being a great dog owner by not treating the every best, dog the same. The best dog right? owner. Um, because they all have their, their individual struggles, they all have their individual personality. And in fact, what we wanted to chat through with you today is effectively 
A great walk isn't about training on the walk. A great walk is about preparing your dog with the skills that they need to make great choices and for that walk not to fill their bucket. And that's not done on the walk, that is done at it's home. It's like your prep at home before you go out. It's like if you're gonna take a lunch and you've prepped and you've mm -hmm. packed it and you're already with it. And for me, I mean, we were out only yesterday um, and it was just beautiful. And we don't think about like, that. They're, they're, they're cool, they're checking in with us. Yeah. We don't have to think too hard on it. It's not complex. Yeah, and it, it's the equivalent of, you know, you wouldn't take your your seven-year-old child, you wouldn't say, right, here's how we're going to learn. I'm going to put you in an exam situation and I'm going to leave you to make all the right choices on this exam paper and I'm going to come back in 20 minutes and you better have done that exam paper. What you do is you teach them everything that they need to learn at every stage. to do the exam well and then they do the exam. What, what, and yet we don't, we understand that with, with human children, but we don't necessarily apply it to our dogs. And what we've got to think is a, a walk for our dogs is an exam. They're, they're constantly being tested. We're, we're, we're constantly um, presenting them with options and we're, we're actively kind of pressuring them to make the right choice when we maybe haven't taught them the right choice before putting them in there. And it's an interesting one because both Tom and I, um, if we have either a young dog that we're working with someone on with training or our own young dog, we're very reluctant just to throw them in at the deep end. We do do, I mean, I remember Thistle, so Tom has a minute to dash on and um, we were out walking and uh, she must have been about seven or eight months and Tom said oh Thistle's coming and yet she hadn't been out with us at all yeah. because when we take the the big dogs who are still not that big but you know what just bigger than Thistle who's tiny and um, when we take the big dogs out then she hadn't been along with us before so when she came out Tom popped her down on the floor she ran around for a bit we had a shortish walk we came back everything yeah. was glorious that was her first yeah. experience out with them whereas I think people put them in those situations time and time again mm -hmm. where actually what we can do is reshape the walk itself so when we say reshape the walk that might mean some homeschooling yeah right so we could do um a level of, of work with our dogs at home yeah. that might mean some fitness training at home so we yeah. do something called triple f a program where um we'll we'll train them to be stronger fitter faster but in the house yeah and actually everything can be done in a small space right tom yeah exactly and what what we want to think about is well what skills and concepts are going to be really useful in creating a stress-free walk. So already I can think calmness is going to be key. Disengagement from the environment is going to be key. Engagement with you is going to be key. Or, or, or you could call it focus, right? Maybe impulse control because the fact is our dogs are going to see things that are going to, you know, trigger some impulses. They're amazing, going to be excited or scared. Amazing proximity. Like yeah. we want a dog that hangs out in close proximity to us because it's when they go at a distance. We were out with a friend only the other day and I remember that little spaniel yeah. running at a great distance. And I had to say to you Go at on. one point, Tom, I'll keep these guys here. You need to go find that little spaniel, like because literally proximity she was, was struggling, not right? In her skill repertoire at that and point, and because the proximity was a, a struggle, then actually that brings with it a whole host of problems: mm -hmm. stock moving, children being worried, yeah. picnickers not liking it. So it brings a whole new, a whole yeah. new struggle alongside. Now you might have like a, a fixed reason as to why you can't walk. Like you might, your dog might have. I don't know, let's say um, Blink had 10 weeks off mm -hmm. walking yeah. because she had a, an operation. Or it could be that we'd have a forced situation for um, a situation where you can't go out for any reason. Mm -hmm. um, or it could be that you're um, not able to go out. So maybe you've had an operation or you're in a situation where you can't um, do that. So lots of reasons why we might not be able to. Yeah. And actually we could choose to. Yeah. That's the most important one, this I think. This is the cool thing. Sometimes we're forced. Sometimes it actually would be encouraged and the right decision for the dog. So we've just been through a couple, quite a few different skills and concepts so you know, you've got um, proximity you've got impulse control we mentioned calmness focus disengagement all of those concepts they can be trained at home and actually if you think about trying to win the battle against the squirrel when you've not done any prep work you're probably going to struggle that's exactly why we made that 25 day sexier than a squirrel challenge that i'm sure a lot of you've been through um, and and it's because actually the, the, a great walk is built at home. A great walk is not built and on a walk. That squirrel, he's damn sexy. Yeah. Like, he's sexy. He's got all the tricks, right? So Swishing his tail. <laughs> so in terms of, you know, going through some practical strategies right now that, that we'd use in considering homeschooling our dogs, first of all, ditching the bowl, but not just ditching the bowl, thinking of this as like a pot of value. Where am I going to put that value? A lot of that value needs to go into proximity. Now, proximity 
doesn't doesn't have to be boring it doesn't have to be just like dropping food at your side like one of the games we play in the sexy than a squirrel challenge is um catch me if you can yeah. and i know for me that gets my heart rate up and it gets my energy up or it could be something like magic hand which i get endless joy mm-hmm. out of watching my dogs stay under my hand and catch things like yeah. i get endless buzz from that yeah and just animating that that daily food allowance around you and in proximity to you it's powerful right it's um it's like le- the leash off game on programs gone on to transform tens of thousands of dogs and owners all over the world and the fact is all of those games are really just all proximity games and and just by you know adding that piece of the puzzle alone people get more stress-free walks so that's powerful then we've got to think also that a walk is a test of our dog's optimism right Oh, mate, yeah, huge, like absolutely huge. This morning alone, just three or four things that really could uh, put your dog in a space that actually, I don't know, let's say Thistle, she's a small dog and a, a big black Labrador, let's just say uh, yeah. that's normally the one that we see on our walks. Um, he just comes out of nowhere and he arrives, a pony. Mm-hmm. Um, so we walk in, Tom and I live in Devon. It's a really beautiful space. You're going to be on bridle paths. Mm-hmm. We see horses. That's normal. We expect to see them. But yeah. at the same time, they test optimism. A cyclist, a jogger, a uh, um, neighborhood postie that pops yeah. out and says, morning. All of those things can really test our dogs in terms of their optimism. And as we've spoken about on previous episodes, you know, optimism and pessimism, it's a fluid thing. So, you know, I I always use that example of you have a bad week at work, you feel unlucky, you're less likely to enter in the lottery because you've had a bad week at work. Lots of negative outcomes have happened. Whereas on the flip side, you have a good week at work where positive outcomes happen and you start describing yourself as, I'm on a lucky streak, right? Um, I'm I'm on a winning streak. And actually all that's happened is you're just more optimistic because you've had more positive outcomes that week. I'll give you an example of that. I compete at uh, international agility and and you know very well, Tom, if I have one win, Mm -hmm. then often I have like 10 wins because it's just like a- It's just that optimism, Yeah, you're feeling in a good space yeah. you're like i got this you suddenly your confidence is boosted you start to feel a little bit like oh i can do this and suddenly bang 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 yeah. bang it's a real ripple effect and the thing that we've got to think is if we're walking our dogs day in day out are we setting them up for a lucky streak or are we setting them up for a, a pessimistic streak because for sure um when a few walks don't go so great and actually they're quite they're, they're, they got worried by something once or twice on a walk a few days in a row that fourth walk they are aware they are pessimistic they are more likely to react and i think that's the biggest thing that we see with our challenges um because they are literally like hashtag i am sexy like they start to get pretty confident about it and they they feel like it we all rise up together in it because we start to really enjoy the challenge and the training and the fun and we start to feel pretty pretty Mm -hmm. confident about it yeah so that's good absolutely so um if you haven't already Make sure that you subscribe to the challenge to the to the podcast, guys. And I well, think they can have the challenge well, too. You can, you can subscribe <laughs> to both. Uh, but um, the other thing is, I think it's really important. Is like it, I just kind of had this moment of realization that people are being told day in day out that they must walk their dogs. And they must socialize their dogs, right? From puppies, they must get them out, they must socialize them. And there's there's so much we could tell you on this, and and we we will. And the, the thing is that actually, that is putting people in a situation where they can't be the very best owner for their dog because they're being forced and told that they must do something uh, that goes against their gut feeling of knowing when it isn't right. And so, it would really help other people to hear about this. So whether you share this podcast with friends, whether you leave a review on iTunes for the podcast, it's entirely up to you. But what we'd say is actually how empowering is it to have permission to make great decisions by the dog in front of you? And then to do that with other owners and to have a community of people that do that with you because we're for sure your community and you can share that alongside your friends. The other thing we'd love you to do, there's a resource that goes along with the podcast. You might not have had it yet. You might not have um, downloaded it for yourself. And and we'd absolutely recommend that you do because it goes through so many things from the way we train how we train what we train some of the little tips and tricks things like that and how do you get it exactly you get it by going to absolutedogs.me forward slash start s-t-a-r-t absolutedogs.me 
forward slash start and um, we put together this this little book for you to effectively get you up to speed it's free to download make sure you download it so reshaping your walks is it for you we'd say for your dog hell yeah for us it's made a huge difference yeah. to our dog's lives and actually we enjoy our walks way more than mm. we ever did um it's a seriously uplifting experience yeah. so with that you've got permission to be the very best owner that your dog could ever wish for it's been fun sharing that's been today's episode of sexier than a squirrel we'll be seeing you next week well, and remember stay, stay sexy. sexy hey before you go have you taken part in the worldwide sexier than a squirrel challenge it's a 25 day online video program huge energy amazing community and over 6,000 people are already taking part the only question is, you know where you are today. Where do you want to be 25 days from now? Head to absolutedogs.me forward slash sexy.